Well, we have currently about 7.3 billion people on this planet and the world population has been growing really fast. So it took only about 12 years to add an additional billion people to the planet. But the growth has been slowing now over the last years and uh, in our medium projections we only expect another 2 billion. Only means there's still a significant number of people but most likely uh, by the middle of the century we'll have about 9.2 billion and then it may peak around 9.4, 9.5 in the 60s and then by the end of the century it may decline to somewhere around 9 billion. But this is only sort of the most likely trajectory and of course in the second half of the century it's quite uncertain how the birth rates who are the main driver of population growth will develop. Well in general there are two main drivers of population growth on the planetary scale. It's the birth rate, how many children are born, and it's the death rate, how many people die. If you look at national populations then migration also makes a difference. Now the main driver clearly is, is fertility. So the uh, main question that we have at the moment is uh, how rapidly will the fertility in Africa decline. In Africa we still have five to six children on average per woman which is very high fertility rates by any standard and if that declines only very slowly then we're going to have massive population growth and the world population will go more than 10 billion. If it declines very rapidly we may even go to 8 or less billion. So that's the main uncertainty range. Uh, the other uncertainty is how low will fertility fall in the countries that already have low fertility. In Europe we have roughly 1.5 children on average per woman, the same level in China. And the question is will we go still below that level or will the birth rate recover somewhat uh, towards two children or will it stay where it is? So where is at the end of the demographic transition what is the ultimate level of fertility is a big issue. We are members of the human species and of course we care about our species and throughout human history in the early millennia a human population was several times threatened by extinction. So of course we want to survive as a species and uh, of course it also matters how many of us there are around uh, primarily with respect to the natural resources, uh, how much food there is, uh, uh, but also how much territory is. Throughout history people have been fighting wars over territory, they wanted living space for themselves. So these are all reasons why it matters. Uh, but uh, we increasingly understand it's not the sheer number of people that matters. It's not the head count if you want, but what is inside the heads. It's what people know, what is the human capital, what is the skills, what is the motivation of people. So in other words, it's it is relevant how many there are, but it matters even more what these people do and what they are able to do. In the past, the demographers have only looked at total population size and how it grows over time. Now in the 20th century, we had already in Europe quite irregular fertility levels. In the 20s, the birth rate went very low levels in many parts of Europe and therefore the age structure was very irregular. So age structure also matters for population projections because it matters how many people will be and are in reproductive age. Now more recently we understood that, that there are other sources of heterogeneity as we say, like how people differ from each other and the key driver here is the level of education. In particular for the birth rate it makes a lot of difference whether women are illiterate, they've never been to school, they take as many children as God gives them or as they just happen to have, that was sort of the pattern throughout most of human history or whether women start to sort of rationally planning their family size, deciding how many children do I want and how do I find means to limit family size. And this transition to sort of desired and limited family size uh, that goes very strongly along with education because education changes the way uh, women uh, see their surroundings, the environment, uh, it makes them more forward-looking and most importantly it empowers them to actually uh, pursue their own typically smaller desired family size as compared to that of their husbands or the in-laws in traditional societies. The long-term population outlook crucially depends on the specific assumptions that you make with respect to the future birth rate. Now for this most recent projections where the UN assumes that the population will grow to almost 11 billion whereas we Yasa believe it's 9.4 and then maybe declining to 9 billion. 
Uh, there the main difference really lies in Africa. There are some African countries such as Nigeria, a big country, currently has about 170 million people. But the UN assumes that the birth rate, which is very high, around six children per woman at the moment, will only very slowly decline. And they project an un incredible and unrealistic 940 million people for Nigeria by the end of the century. Well, we think this is not going to happen for various reasons. Our own projections are just above 500 million people, still a big increase from the current 170 million. Uh, for several reasons. First of all, we think that the birth rate has already declined a bit to 5.5 children per woman. And the other main difference is that we, unlike the UN and unlike most other agencies, explicitly factor in the education structure of women. So we do the projections by age, uh, sex and level of education. And if you look at the education of young women in Nigeria today, so more than half of the women aged 20 to 24 already have secondary education, going to school at least until the age of 15. Whereas if you look at the women that are 20 years older, they are uh, 40 to 45, there it's less than a quarter. So there has been significant increase in education over the last few years, partly due to the Millennium Development Goals where there was much investment in schooling, after a time when it was more stagnant. So we believe and have reason to assume that this improvement in female education of the young women will speed up the fertility decline and we will not have such high birth rates for the coming years. So that's the main difference, not only for Nigeria, but for other African countries as well. A second difference is in China. So the UN assumes that in China the fertility is only 1.66 now, it's, it's below replacement, but we think it's even lower, we think it's somewhere 1.4, 1.5. And most importantly, the UN assumes it will increase, it will never fall below the 1.6, but increase uh, after that. And since China is such a big country, we assume it will stay for quite a while at 1.4. So for such a big country, it makes a big difference. Well, so here I'm proud to present uh, this new book, which has uh, more than a thousand pages and published with Oxford University Press. Uh, it uh, took us more than three years uh, to produce it. It has a scientific input from more than 550 population experts from around the world, partly contributing through an online questionnaire about how they assess the drivers of future fertility, mortality and migration. Uh, we also have 72 authors involved, contributing authors or lead authors. So it's really a major assessment of what do we know today about uh, likely future trends in population in all countries of the world. So half of the volume about is uh, the substantive analysis about the drivers and what we know, all the theories, all the empirical data. And the other half is then presenting specific scenarios for every country in the world and looking uh, into the implications. What is uh, population aging going to mean for our future economic productivity and future of social security systems? Uh, and in particular, the really innovative part of this book is that we now have it not just by age and sex, but also by level of education for all countries. So we can study what uh, does the higher or lower level of education in a specific scenario mean for the economic growth, for the well-being of people, for the health and many other factors. We uh, have a, a large appendix in the book itself and then we have an online database where everybody can retrieve any specific data for any point in time, for any age group, for every country in the world. Mm -hmm.